This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you again by the Friends of the Magic Word. Those are the ones who, through their financial support with their donations and monthly pledges, help keep this podcast going week after week. And this week, we want to welcome our two newest members, that's Gary and Janine Carson. Thank you guys for your financial donation. That really helps us a lot. And for those of you who are out there who would like to know more about how perhaps you could assist us financially, all you have to do is go to themagicwordpodcast.com, and there you'll see a link that will tell you more about why we could use your help and also a short video to watch and also ways that you can uh, support us and by pledging you get some pretty cool perks along the way and it's also some pretty cool stuff just through a regular donation anyhow thank you uh, very much again gary and janine and we appreciate you listening and also for your financial support Well, last week we were presenting to you a couple of updates, convention updates, from Las Vegas from the Magic Collector Expo, and that was a lot of fun and pretty cool. And those of you who regularly tune in on Thursday mornings, at least those in the United States, I guess wherever you might be elsewhere in the world, it's maybe a different time whenever those podcasts are released in your time zone, but when we typically release them on Thursday mornings here in Texas, Texas, and pretty regular, like clockwork. However, last week, because we knew we were going to be going to Las Vegas and we would be spending a lot of time putting together the convention reports as we do each time we attend a convention, I felt like there would be uh, enough content for you to digest (laughs) with the couple of uh, episodes that we presented and released then on Saturday and Sunday. That's why we didn't have anything last Thursday. We return again here today on our regular time slot, which is 9 o'clock a.m. That's uh, Central Time in the United States. Anyhow, that is going back to uh, regular, kind of. And I say that because we are also, uh, after this week, going to be attending the Texas Association of Magicians Convention, which is in Austin, Texas. Well, actually, just outside of Austin, to the east a little bit, which is a little town called Pflugerville. But there are a lot of activities that are going to be happening, and we'll be giving daily reports from that convention as well, and you don't want to miss that. Uh, Following that, of course, we'll have another live convention, which is going to be in Columbus, Ohio, with the Magi Fest. And uh, that convention has been limited to just, I believe, 300 people. And as I understand it, they're also going to be supplementing that with a virtual convention then as well, in order to allow those who wanted to attend physically but couldn't get in in time are able to at least uh, watch this virtually. Well, again, we're going to be reporting from that one as well. And other things coming up, too. I mean, this is a busy year. I feel like after we've kind of give, been given the go-ahead to go ahead and and uh, be released into the world uh, wearing masks or not, at least we're having an opportunity to mix and mingle and rub shoulders, at least if not shake hands, at least bump fists, and uh, in some cases uh, give a hug. At least have a martini or two, <laughs> perhaps, on some uh, Thursday nights uh, around the bar and enjoy conversations with one another again as we kind of return slowly into the real life world of magic conventions. And so again, if you can't attend or choose not to or whatever, you can enjoy them vicariously through our daily convention reports for the ones we'll be attending. And again, there'll be quite a few we'll be attending. So be sure to come back here regularly and also so that you are kept up to date with the convention reports and everything else that we're involved in here. And like last week when we were delayed, those were all reported in our weekly pod letter. So if you have not subscribed to the pod letter, please do. Just go to themagicwordpodcast.com, and there you should see a little pop-up that will come onto your screen, or you can go to the tab and subscribe to the pod letter, and that way you're kept up to date and you know what's happening, so that way you won't be surprised. But you can also, through that pod letter, receive some pretty cool information as to who is on this week, who's 
coming up next week and also some suggestions from the archives. It doesn't take very much of your time to just briefly look over the pod letter that comes out from week to week, and it's not intrusive and gives you good information. So please consider subscribing. It's free and doesn't cost you anything. But if you want to help us financially, you know what to do. I told you the first of this podcast. (laughs) Okay, let's move on then. This week we're going to go back to Branson, Missouri, where I had an opportunity to see another fantastic show. And this was another friend of mine who I had first met at the Magic Island when we worked together here in Houston, Texas, many years ago. Perhaps I think we decided like back in the 80s or so. But anyhow, he has traveled the world quite literally. And he was a resident magician in Las Vegas for a very long time, I believe the Tropicana. And he, uh, I want to say like 13 years or something, anyhow, very long time. And he now has a residency in Branson, Missouri at the uh, Shanghai Theater. I believe that's called the Mickey Gilly Theater. And he uh, was at the Andy Williams Theater, which I understand was up for sale. And they closed that and he found another place to move his show. He had a show called Mansion of Dreams, I believe it was. And he had to scale back his show a little bit. But it's still an amazing show, a large show. It is a good size stage there at the Mickey Gilly Theater. So you get to, uh, if you get a chance to go to Branson, you need to see the show because it, it has been voted as the best of Branson. Period. I mean, the best show. Not well. He'll talk about that a little bit then too. But another thing is, of course, uh, he is no longer working with the big cats. That is, no more tigers or anything. Although he was well known for working with them when he was back in Las Vegas, and we talk uh, quite a bit about that towards the end of the podcast, uh, and also others who had worked with big cats like Siegfried and Roy and his relationship with them, and of course about the accident uh, with uh, uh, the tiger and Roy, and go into a little bit about that then as well. So there are a lot of things I think you will really enjoy and learn and get a lot out of this particular episode. Well, enough for me. Let's hear what he has to say. Please welcome my friend here this week, Mr. Rick Thomas, here on The Magic Word. All right, well, we are here in Branson, actually at the uh, Mickey Gilly Shanghai Theater in uh, Branson, Missouri, and we have just uh, seen a phenomenal show, a Las Vegas-style show, which uh, we're seeing in Branson. Uh, it's Branson's the place where they don't have any gambling, but they do have fantastic shows, and this was a Las Vegas-style show in the finest order. This actually, uh, the entertainer that I'm talking with here today is someone who has won the Entertainer of the Year for Branson, two years running. Is that right? Yes, yeah? that's right. And, yes. which I think is fantastic, it's not just the variety entertainer, not just the uh, singing or the whatever. It's like the entertainer of the year, Mr. Rick Thomas. Hey there, Rick. I'm um, okay. <laughs> not not just the banjos. Yeah. Not, not just the violins. Not the best evening Not the show country. No, or no. The breakfast yeah. show. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm amazed. I, I really was, because it's such a music uh uh, part of the the country it's all about the music it's all about right you know and so and you have and, no music as except. A, ma- a magician comes yeah. waltzing in <laughs> and uh and everybody watches the show and we just had um like 16 members from another show come in even last night mm-hmm. uh and they just walked out and they said oh my goodness everybody from our show needs to see this show i'm just so honored so it's we're doing right. great is it because of the production value they're saying they need to see this and the choreography yes. and everything else yes. and the lighting yes. and the sound and everything is perfect <laughs> I mean, this, again, I, I want to emphasize for magicians who are listening to this podcast who might attend conventions, and you never, I always wonder why we can't have better sound. Well, you need to have professionals. I mean, and you guys have got perfect sound and lighting and everything. I mean, it is, it is a, a very high energy show, and you break the fourth wall very well. Very interesting, uh, the way you engage the audience, talk with the audience, all the way to the back row. And this is, looks like it seats probably, what, 800? No. Uh, just, just about 1,000. 1,000, okay. 1,000 seats. Yeah. Uh, and you had moved here from the uh, Andy Williams Theater? Yes. Okay. Now, the Andy Williams Theater here in town was 2,000 seats, but it closed just because of COVID mm-hmm. and they shuttered their doors. It was just really tough to keep our show open. And then this last year, they didn't know if they're going to reopen again, which mm-hmm. they haven't. Yeah. And at that point, Mickey Gilly reached his hands out and said, Rick, why don't you come over to my theater? And I just, I was thrilled. And when we walked into the theater, we also realized it had a full LED wall. Mm-hmm. And the moment that I, because for those people who have seen the Mansion of Dreams, that is, 
I have to say in, in humbly, an epic production. It is the b- most beautiful set. Uh, the whole mansion is on fire in the middle of the show and it's completely wow. destroyed. Mm-hmm. And it's Physically, just, I mean, it looks like a, yeah, it's that's, not that's, like a, a no, it's a, a massive yeah. Broadway style production. Yeah. And it closed. And here I am on this stage, which is a fourth of the size. You can't fit one set from that show on this stage. But because we had the LED wall, I, I for three months, barricaded myself in my office mm-hmm. and just started mixing video and re-editing and mixing the Mansion of Dreams digitally. Right. And now it works. It, it does. And I think with the backdrop that you have over there it makes it a, a larger production then you got the uh, big imags on the both sides uh then as well that kind of brings everything in and makes it seem intimate even though you've got a thousand people you know yes. who are here yes uh and what, what about the uh the music by the way is that something uh obviously it's some copyrighted music how does that work yes as far as ASCAP and all some of those? some of it is my own written music that i've had for uh some time like my bird act in the opening that's all original music uh-huh. written for my birds uh and then ASCAP app and bmi mm-hmm. uh we pay all the rights for anything that we utilize in the theater mm-hmm. uh and uh and we we you know that's the same with doing my magic as well i always wanted to make sure that no matter what i did or what we created that those that were um the creative forces behind it were uh rightfully compensated, uh, compensated. Mm-hmm. and i have always 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 made sure that the highest standard must be kept and uh, making sure that everybody who is anybody that's a part of your show, whether they're seen or not, are taken care of. And that includes the music as well. Yeah. I was talking with Gary Carson, and he has a bit which came from Jeff McBride. And he said, I paid him for that bit, you know, mm-hmm. of getting somebody up in the audience. And I have to say, by the way, that your the bl- blading <laughs> ladder levitation variation that you have <laughs> is, is great uh, with the chairs. I uh, really like that rather than the ladders. It's very cool organic updated people know what that is uh thank i love you. it love thank it. you thank you i think you. walter would have been very happy with and that. of course the routine the, the with the child is it, yes it, it goes way beyond the effect oh, itself no it brings another whole element where yeah. someone comes back behind there and stands uh, yeah and, and i i uh i've always said that the magic is important but not as important as the actual show mm-hmm. so my my whole concept is make sure that the audience is thoroughly entertained not fooled right but entertained as I was telling someone earlier, I think it's the difference between Doug Henning and David Copperfield. Doug Henning always, both being great, uh, Doug having something more of that wow mystery factor, and David Copperfield having the narrative uh, presentation of something that they're doing and explaining, uh, again, a, a show, I guess, or the performance, which is what yours is. I see a lot of things happening, like when The Invisible Man, I mean... The, the uh, girl without a metal thing. Isn't was, that cool? Oh, it was. I didn't know where to look. Yes, know? I know. Well, <laughs> th- when I had, I had always loved old movies, and the, every story in my show is the truth. Yeah. So when I talk about sitting there and watching Johnny Carson with my dad, that's the truth. And then we'd watch an old movie. Yeah. And I remember the the Invisible Man, and as a little boy, I was inspired. I said, "Man, these these things are amazing. What what if we did this live?" Yeah. And of course, it is a disembodied. But you take that movie. And you mix it just right Mm -hmm. and uh, add some really new age music to it and a great illusion and some beautiful ladies on stage making Mm -hmm. me vanish. It works. And that video playing right behind the illusion and just just going straight through the illusion is just. Yes, it shows it. it It's beautiful. The Invisible Man is invisible (laughs) and so are you. You know. Yeah, it does emphasize it. That was part of, I guess, the the thirty three Claude Rains movie. Uh, yes, the Middle Man. That was all. That was okay. from the Claude Rains movie. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, they've updated that several times, but nothing like the original. You know, of course, nope. as you said, and, and as you pointed out, also people should go back and watch some of the originals because they didn't have CGI back then, and look at some of the things they were doing with special effects then, which is different what they're doing then today. So, yeah, and and, and that's the reason I think then, Rick, why you are breaking that fourth wall is because of your authenticity of which you are bringing your reality to everyone and they can feel that uh, your emotion like when you're talking about the i mean everybody in branson gives credit to the military you know and it seems like you're genuine in your feelings towards them as well as everything else in the way you treat uh, the volunteers and everybody who's uh, involved with this 
Uh, so you had been here now in this theater for a year, right out of a year? Uh, mm, about four months. Four months, less, much less than a year. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're sitting here now in, in July of 2021. Uh, and so how much longer is the contract that you got here? In Well, I've been told that they never, ever, ever want me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. So you're going to retire came, here. <laughs> when we came waltzing in, uh, they just said, Oh, please. Oh, please. This is your home forever. Right. Yes. <laughs> and I said, look, I love Branson and I am so honored and thrilled to have a life here. Uh, of course, with the Andy Williams theater and now the, the Mickey Gilly, I just wanted to make sure that that the show I presented was the best I could do mm-hmm. in the theater that we're in. And I give it everything I've got. There's no more space in this theater for any, I have so many grand illusions I would love to bring in. Mm-hmm. I, and I think that we pretty much do quite quite a lot on this stage for what we have backstage. There's nothing left. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so you have to rotate things. Have everything's, oh out. my goodness. When I was at the Tropicana in Vegas, um, we had half of my show on two uh, 20-foot platforms that were lifted up by um, uh, chain motors mm-hmm. above us. And that held half the show. And then we did the illusions. And then in the intermission, we'd lower down the platforms and rotate the magic around and send it back up in the air. We had the Follies Berger playing in that theater as well. Yeah. So I had to, um, to make up some different ways of keeping the, the magic on the stage and it, it mm-hmm. virtually being impossible, but don't ever tell Rick Thomas that it's impossible. Um, everything in theater is possible. Mm-hmm. You just have to be a little bit more creative. So, I, I love having, you know, the fact you got your own theater, people then come to see you as opposed to going out to do things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that seems to be kind of what your thing has been as far as working theaters rather than traveling about like on cruise ships and things. You've done cruises and everything, you know, then too, and been around the world and traveled wherever. So in working a lot of places and different theaters where you do have some room and you can have places in the back and the wings where you can also put these different props. Cause you were saying about how, my goodness, I got to rotate things in and out. Uh, have you ever worked uh, at Reno there at the Hilton where they've got that huge stage? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. I, I have not worked that particular stage, but yes, it's massive. Uh, didn't Mark, Kalen Mark Kalen, right. There. He's got like a 747 yeah, backstage. 747. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I thought you wouldn't have problems with that. Well, that's room. why the Mansion of Dreams and the and the Andy Williams Theater was just so, so yeah. was wonderful. Was the Mansion of Dreams where Justin Flom uh, performed no. when he was in town way back when? No? No. Um, my Mansion of Dreams is at the Andy Williams Theater. They have the Mansion Theater. That's what I was thinking, Mansion Theater. Right, right, perhaps. right. You, my, you call the theater the Mansion Theater then, or Mansion uh, of Dreams. I call the the theater the Andy Williams Performing Arts Center. Yeah. And it's the Mansion of Dreams in the Andy oh, okay. Williams Center. Yeah. Okay. What I also like is how you continue to brand that throughout the show, where you're having that callback, you know, with the Mansion of Dreams. Yeah. And everything in your photos, like where you're sitting in a big throne, like it's a mansion. You're kind of welcome to my mansion and the pictures, then the background. I think it's kind of cool as far as the uh, the background, the photos and everything. So you have made all those, you said, digitally uh, through your computer? Yes. Um, people, they're, they scratch their head. When they find out, well, who is the people who put all this together for you? And I said, <laughs> I did. I edited it. I mixed it. I created it. All my billboards, even when I was in Vegas, yeah. all my television commercials, I did it. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> because I don't know. I, I'll tell you why. I was doing a show. I was doing a, a television special down in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I was covering the bills. And it was a lot of money and it was a lot of crew and swing boom cameras and just the production was huge. And at the end of the production, I saw the final version of it. I looked at it and said, I can do this myself. (laughs) Why am I paying somebody else? And it was an aha moment for me. And uh, at that point, I realized that. Uh, I have a love for. If I wasn't doing magic, I'd doing. I'd be doing post production for television. You just love it that much, yeah. I love it that much. I like. I would. I would love to be a, a, a post producer, a movie, or you know. Have you been in on a movie set like that? Where oh, I say set, actually, after in the post production studios mm-hmm. in Vegas or in Hollywood, where they've done that and yes, and worked with them. Okay. Yes, uh, in fact, that I had a bit of training there. Um, I was. I was I worked with a company called Blue Water Post Production. Mm-hmm. This is when we had one inch reel to reels. Okay. Still, I went in and wired 
that entire studio. I put in the wire system, and I was then a cameraman for the company. They they were the company that ad- actually edited the Indiana Jones mm-hmm. and the um, the original um, Superman movies. Okay, so you were a gaffer. I was a g- <laughs> yes, and I was on camera. Okay, and in fact, I remember that if I can remember back the far, um, Mickey Thompson off road racing. I think it was Mickey. I think that's what it was. No. Um, I can't remember. There was some off road racing at the Coliseum in Los Angeles, and I was one of the cameramen up at the top of the Coliseum, mm-hmm. and they're doing this racing and brought all that dirt into the Coliseum. I almost got killed. Car went off the track and uh, took took my camera out. But, wow. You know, you had to jump? I had to jump. And <laughs> But it was good because I was behind the cameras. I, I would do commercials. I would learn, and that's what I did. And, and then I took and brought it into my world of magic. Yeah. When that came towards the camera did you catch the film i mean did it ruin the film or were you able to to have good footage to use they were there so i could hear my headset i lost my headset the camera was destroyed it went right through the camera i jumped to the side and you could hear the headphones still going anybody hear rick is rick okay is rick okay <laughs> the camera's gone yeah and i you know and i just i'm shaking up and i'm just sitting to the side i said that was amazing <laughs> but was that film or was that digital so that was something that was kept digitally or was that something filmed that was destroyed in the accident no it was uh, digitally kept digitally okay wow <laughs> yeah now back to you you were okay though <laughs> yeah i was okay. <laughs> okay yeah it was kept on yeah. um beta beta decks uh, you know going back to when we first met at the magic island back in houston way back uh, when when the 80s maybe 80s? Yes. yeah uh you weren't you're working with lions and tigers that kind of came later or were you working with them and you just didn't bring them to the island no it came later i actually um uh was out in um oh, i was doing cruise ships um but i was actually um doing a lot of state and county fairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew of the magic... uh, Island? The magic... No, the uh, magic... The sand castle. Oh, the magic castle? Sand castle in Guam. Okay. And uh, they were looking to have another act go out to the sand castle, but they needed one with a tiger. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to work with tigers. So I got a hold of... You had a death wish. (laughs) Yeah, I got a hold of the directors of the San Diego Wild Animal Park and uh, trained with them for six months. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we brought brought our first tiger out there. His name was Zeus. And they came out with me and spent the next six months with me. And after being with me for a year, they said, Rick, there's nothing else we can teach you. You're on hmm. your own. Wow. But I have always felt I've, I've really had a hard time with rent a cat. Mm-hmm. I've had a hard time with magicians standing in front of a camera with a cat and getting a, a picture for yeah. a pose. Mm-hmm. I think that they need to put their time, their effort and their life into it mm-hmm. to give them the right and privilege to stand there with a tiger. Yeah. And I decided that's what I was going to do. And I've always felt that the moment that the tiger appears, I'm no longer a magician. I'm literally a tiger handler. Mm -hmm. It's not about the magic. It's not about anything but just the safety of the audience. Yes, right, right. So, so I just think that I'm the one who climbed into the cages. I'm the one who cleaned their cages. I'm the one who fed them. I'm the one who trained. I think that at that point I, I rightfully had the right to stand there and, have my photos taken with tigers. I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, after, um, you know, we had Siegfried and Roy, and Roy was was hurt, of course. And I was there at the hospital that night when, uh, when of course, it had happened. I'd finished my show and ran over there. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't let us in to see Roy at that time. But uh, the next day, I was presenting my show in an afternoon show, and I was shaken. Uh, and still I thought at the trop or where I was still at the Tropicana. And I said to my cast, I said, I don't know if we should we really try and do the you know the animals in the show. Why don't we consider taking them out it's for the performance? Network, national international news. They knew about yeah. this. Yeah. And I asked the I asked the front desk. I said, How's our sales going for the day? And they said, You're sold out. And I uh, said, Well, let the audience speak. Yeah. And they all knew that I had tigers. Now, one, they wanted to maybe see somebody else eat. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like a car wreck. Or two, yeah. they realized that uh, it is what it is mm-hmm. and that life goes on. And that's how I felt. And, you know, and I spoke to the audience that day because I needed to get the jitters shaken off and told them that everybody knows what happened that night with uh, Roy. And right. um, 
that we'll be presenting a show that is extremely safe for everyone and enjoy. So that's why. And now today I did my show, but I usually do questions and answers in oh, the show. But really? today I from did, the audience, right? yeah, from the audience, I let them ask questions. Did that give you pause though? The next day, I don't mean to be pun, a uh, pause, but did that give you pause the next day to think, oh, you know, this happened. I wonder if they could turn on me now today. You know, well, a little bit skittish that next time. <laughs> If any person who has ever said that they have not been hurt working with these animals, they're lying to oh, you. Mm-hmm. So I had already been hurt before no again. Roy and I, yeah. Roy and I had had conversations, mm-hmm. private conversation, mm-hmm. about the challenges that we face with the tigers, yeah. and how we accept these dangers. But it's the same thing. I I give the example of Dale Earnhardt. Uh, and uh, he dying on the NASCAR. race NASCAR, yeah. and what are they doing the next day? They're racing, racing another again. race. Yeah. It didn't stop them. And Roy gets hurt, and the whole world falls apart. Mm-hmm. And then I point out to people, I said, you realize that there were two people shot and killed in Vegas the same night that Roy was hurt with his tiger, but nobody talks about that. They just talk about Roy being bit by a tiger. But because everybody doesn't have a tiger and they're, it's very foreign to mm-hmm. their lifestyle, right. they flip out. Uh, people have a car in their garage. Mm-hmm. So here they are in their garage, uh, getting in their car. They, they drive down the highway. They see a wreck on the highway. And it, they look at the wreck and then they say, wow, those people have a terrible a terrible uh, day ahead of them. And then the moment you drive past the accident, you forget about it. And if you were smart, you'd get out of your car and you'd walk home because it's crazy driving in cars. It's dangerous, it, right? It is, more so than flying in a plane, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when people are, are flying, they I, I know some people have a fear of flying. It's like, well, why? I mean, it's you're safer in the air than you are on the ground in, in a car. But you're right. I think the fact when you're using some wild animals, and there is always something wild uh, in their nature, even though they're domesticated to a point, I think something can turn on them. And, and you're right. I think if at any point you are fearful of them perhaps they they can they sense that fear i guess yes okay i had a heightened sense of awareness that's the better thing i wasn't scared yeah (laughs) just heightened sense of awareness Uh, but there were times where it was kind of frightening but um, again the training constantly working with them if you ask me now to go back and work with tigers again i would tell you never Yes. I think that there was a time in my life or many of our lives where we feel that we're invincible, that we can do things and it's not going to happen to us as it was with Siegfried and Roy. And I, in my 20s, 30s and early 40s working with the Tigers, there's just a time in your life where that works. And then then you look back on it and go, what was I thinking? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. At some point, whenever you get older and perhaps more mature, you're thinking, well, was I that immature to, to... do some crazy things like you do when you're young and driving, for an example, and driving too fast or whatever, taking chances when you're younger, thinking, well, I'm Superman. As you get older, then you walk a little slower, you know. And so you... Uh, no, I don't walk too slow yet in my show. <laughs> I, I still move around pretty good. You talk slow, which allows people to understand what you're saying, which is another thing to compliment you on from the standpoint, certainly. You understand everything that you're saying. You are enunciating properly. You're not running through. I talk too fast during my shows, I know, and I've heard some other magicians do that as well. And it's endemic, I think, where we're trying to quickly get through something. Uh, maybe it's through nerves or whatever, but the thousands of times you performed, it's just uh, good, you know, from standpoint of you you do speak slowly you wait for them to applaud and laugh without stepping on your own lines anyhow i don't mean to keep patting you on the back throughout this whole chat here but <laughs> no it's it's i'm just <laughs> it's it makes it easier for me it makes me i, I appreciate it I, that, that you've actually seen it and you experience it and now we're talking about it straight after yeah. you you're talking about also even one of the simplest pieces i do um, the liquid glass yes you guys were talking about how that is a unique piece in the show I was told by Jim Steinmeier, Rick, you got to do this trick. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, it doesn't fit me. And they, they demonstrated it to me, and it just didn't didn't work. And really? Then um, Gabe Blackstone said, you know, um, um, Blackstone did it. You you should do this piece. It's perfect for you, Rick. You have a speaking ability yep. that, uh, that few don't. And I said, no, nah, it's just not right. And so Tara was dancing around with her ribbon. Yes. Because uh, she was a dancer and 
competition ribbon well, that dance. Makes such perfect sense with the way that the video complements that dance that she's doing on stage that had been recorded at another time with the music and everything. Again, you're kind of looking at everything. It's just a an immersive experience there, and it makes it into a great production. Thank you. And and I know you just explained something that the audience is not quite understanding, yeah, because uh, we're on um, you know Audio. on the on the yeah. air, but. When I watched her do this ribbon dance, I just said, that's beautiful. And the moment I did that, I said, let's use one of those ribbons through the glass. Then I went back to Jim and I said, I can do this. Mm -hmm. This is right. And then when I was creating this piece for this theater and we had the LED board, uh, we had, of course, videotaped the Mansion of Dreams at the uh, Andy Williams Theater. Mm -hmm. And I am in my office and I had that beautiful moment. I said, oh, my goodness. Let's have Tara dance with herself on stage with that ribbon. And so we took the video of her performance and put it behind her as she danced it mm-hmm. in mirror image. Right. And I have I have literally people say that that shins shivers down my spine. They go, that is extremely moving piece. Mm-hmm. And I remember Tara, when she's walking to my office, she goes, what are you doing? I go, I, don't, don't bother me. Yeah. This is really good. <laughs> I've got this one. <laughs> and uh, now she you know, dances uh, with herself in that image. And, and the, the illusion is just called beautiful. Yes, uh, and it's it. it is. That's a good name for it as well. I want to circle back for just a second, just to finish up what you're talking about with the animals then as well. And that is, did you ever rent them out to other magicians there in Vegas? No. Okay. No, I I would utilize my tigers at a lot of corporate events, mm-hmm. but I never believed in it. I never believed in, in renting them out to somebody else. Again, I didn't think that they had the right nor privilege to just waltz in and, and take the applause and the mm-hmm. kudos uh, for working with these animals. Also, they don't know what they're doing around them. Yeah. And even though they're caged, they're still a dangerous animal Mm -hmm. they're trained but never tamed and so often we even had uh we would tell everybody in my show you cannot be within six to eight feet of any caged tiger ever in the show and that's dancers stage crew management and one of our stage managers walked well not walked but ran by one of our tiger cages a little close one night and our tiger stuck stuck his paw out and knocked him out knocked him to the floors i mean yeah we had smelling salts and we woke him up and he was fine then we started to laugh at first it was but honestly it was a hilarious moment to watch that tiger and that guy run across the stage and he stick his paw out and just go and knocked him out. But didn't scratch him in the claws. Didn't no, no claw. No, no. And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm telling you, yeah. stay away from the cages. Yeah. <laughs> See, now you can laugh, but yeah, back but then, uh, the that time. was this. Oh my it, goodness! Is that part of the insurance uh, as well that you would have with the cats? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Everybody was covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, the insurance was a big deal, and um, you had to really make sure that you were covered with the tigers. Wow, and so it was per was it be per incident that they would have a payout if there was something? If uh... no, it was just full coverage for okay. uh, for just the the use. Where of do you the go tigers. to get insurance for wild animals? I mean, you have to have they're obviously licensed. Lloyd's of so, London. I, okay, I was about to ask of Lloyd's of London because they do about everything. I think. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and then you finally gotten I say rid of you no longer use them and you have the uh, larger. Dogs. What kind of dogs are they again? Great Pyrenees. Great Pyrenees. Those are. I had a Samoyed, so I know the shedding issue <laughs> with the with the white dogs. Uh, Joni Spina had some as well, some uh, Samoids, yeah. uh, and uh, those Pyrenees are are amazing they're and stunning. they're they're She's big. Amazing. Yeah, they're beautiful, but they have replaced that. Is that partially because I was thinking about circuses where they have uh, animal rights people have said you know no more elephants and or whatever and they finally got rid of the circus. Yeah, but... they're they're worried about the exotic animals. Uh, I personally have always felt that whether it be a dog, tiger, bird, whatever, humans were never supposed to have animals as pets. Mm. No one said, hey, these are supposed to be pets. So uh, people will say, well, you have a tiger. That's crazy. And I'll say, well, look at how many people have been killed by their dogs. That's true. You know, and, and, they, and they, no one takes their dogs away. Everybody still has dogs. And there are more people killed by dogs than anybody by tigers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. when you look at the, the percentages, it's, it's overwhelming about uh, – it's just dangerous having these animals. 
Um, but but once you've understood that and you and you you have these animals and I have the dogs, I thought to myself, well, I know that people are having an issue with the tigers. I sent out a newsletter and I said to everybody, what do you think if I put the dogs in my show? And the response was huge. Everybody started talking about their dogs and their cats and all their sure. stories about their animals because they could relate to it. Mm-hmm. They couldn't relate to the tigers. So I knew I could put dogs in the show and people wouldn't have an issue because – there are dog lovers out there, and they don't have a problem with that. Right. Strange, I know, but for that reason, yes. And they're big dogs, so it kind of would be similar, I guess, to the, the larger animals and everything that you had. And so then you put them into a game preserve, or where are they? Uh, yes, in I, Keepers I, of the Wild, the tigers. Okay. Talk a little bit about what it was you had mentioned during the show as far as how many tigers there were and what are the, how few there are now and how it's important to care for them. And if you hadn't, we wouldn't have them today. I I still, with the Tigers not being out of the show, still keep them in the show. And I play a video that shows my life with the Tigers. And then I tell them that um, in the year 1900, there were about 120,000 Bengal Tigers in the wild. And today there's about 3,000. And they're worth about $100,000 a piece dead. Dead. Wow. And we can't stop the poachers from killing them. And there's people out there screaming and yelling, set the Tigers free, set the Tigers free. That's awesome, but we can't stop people from killing them once we put them out there. Mm-hmm. So it's the catch-22. You can't, you can't keep putting these animals out there if you can't stop the poachers from killing them. So you're in a situation where the best you can do is put them in a reserve here at home and try and keep them alive as long as possible sure. in the safety and comfort of a, a reserve. And for that reason, I moved them to Keepers of the Wild. Uh, it's just past Kingman, Arizona, off Route 66. Mm-hmm. And it is a stunning facility. It's up in the valley right before the Grand Canyon. And I was really pleased, honored, and lucky that I was able to put my tigers there. And they take the the care uh, of the tigers. I gave them everything. I gave them my trailers. Mm-hmm. I gave them everything I did to move the tigers around. Everything that I could to help them and assist them in their efforts as well. And there are a tremendous amount of people who are who are giving uh, charity to this organization. It it needs support. Uh, we continue to support it as well, and it's called Keepers of the Wild. Uh, and uh, you need to look it up and um, yeah, where can people donate if they want to help that cause? Straight to the, straight to them. Okay. I know that my responsibility is also, um, like you see when I sell the tigers in the show, uh, stuffed I've, tigers, stuffed tigers, yeah, <laughs> stuffed tigers. I uh, my responsibility has been to actually support uh, in India some of the reserves and their trucks and the maintenance on their trucks hmm. to keep the trucks going for them to stop the poachers. Gotcha. Uh, the men who, who are at the reserve and, and watch over it, um, some of my money has gone to actually taking care of the vehicles to stop the poachers. That's a dangerous job. I can't imagine how tough that would be. And it's, it's all, crazy. Yeah. Super, super crazy. Have you physically been out there to see that effort? Yes. Mm-hmm. And? Uh-huh. And <sighs> I've also seen it in Africa as well. Uh-huh. Uh, it's overwhelming to me. Uh, it is wild to see literally these men out there standing in the middle of what you would think is nowhere with mm-hmm. rifles uh, and just literally protecting these animals. Wow. And they're in reserves. And these poachers crawl into the reserves, kill these animals and pull them out of the reserve. Right. For the craziest of things. For tigers, it's all their body parts. For the rhinos, it's for their tusks and or their their horns, horns yeah. and uh, they just keep doing it. But to be out there and look at these uh, these men actually stand out there twenty four hours a day with rifle in mm-hmm. hand, protecting these animals. I was going to say it had to be twenty four seven because you can't just say okay it's dark I'm going to bed. You know they're out <laughs> hunting probably yeah. at night, and so uh, the poachers as well as the yeah. uh, wild animals. So it's been a good part of my life. I I appreciate what it did for my life and how it was in my show. Mm-hmm. I appreciate now that I can be uh, part of the conservation effort. And uh, I'll just stick with my dogs. <laughs> as far as that conservation effort, it, you mentioned during a show about uh, Joe Exotic, the Lion King or Tiger King, yeah. uh, of course. And there apparently are other reserves, if you will, or places where they are trying to help animals, but not so much of his place. Mm. But uh, how do you determine which one is going to be the right one for your animals? I mean, are there several? I mean, not 
lot, but there are a few around the country. Yeah, there are a few around the country, and you just have to you have to educate yourself. You just have to go out there and you have to see what what's what it's all about. Yeah, and who's taking care of them and their history and and what their purpose is. Did you go to Joe Exotic's place and check that? Never, never no, ever. I don't know. Like you didn't know I anything said, about that until I didn't it even, came out. I had no idea <laughs> that guy existed. Wow, I talked to Rob Lake, and he was the one who. His name was used by Joe Exotic because he was doing because he had the tigers. He started doing magic, and he was using Rob Lake's branded name basically. And he Rob had to sue to get his name back. And it, long story, not fun. He said not a good part of his life. Oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> to, uh, to to do all that from here again, you can stay for I guess kind of as long as you want. And I always like to know what people's long term plans are. If they had like in your case, have done a little bit of everything, and you finally get to a venue where where people are coming to see you without having you to go to them. Is that something that you would like to retire here? It almost, it almost doesn't matter to me anymore where I end up. I've Mm -hmm. been really lucky with my career. I performed in so many countries across this world. Uh, And your favorite is what? um, Hong Kong. Okay. Singapore. I love Hong Kong. I like Hong Kong because it's the old and new world kind of squashed together. You can walk across the street and and be in the most beautiful hotels. Mm -hmm. And then two blocks down, they're cooking in the middle of the street on these little cookers. (laughs) You know, it's just two different worlds still, even today. Um, but there are some amazing places that I've luckily been. And then Vegas, almost 20 years, uh, and uh, then on, on the cruise ships, and then, of course, Guam, and I lived in Hawaii for five years, and I've always had the show. I've always been performing. I've been very lucky. People say, how do you do? And I said, well, it's the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just I just don't stop, and I don't want to stop now, and I'm thrilled with my lifestyle. I'm thrilled with the theater that I'm in. The audiences seem to be just loving the show. Mm-hmm. You can see the response of the audience. It's just so strong yes it is right uh, you're talking about uh, asia it's the same thing franz loves that they have larger audiences they seem to be really appreciative of magic and magicians and so it really magic plays sometimes better there than it does here i am um, i we did uh, korea for seven months i japan i've done a tremendous amount in japan uh and we also three months a year tour I still do theaters across the United States and Canada, Mm -hmm. and this next season I have no less than 20 theaters across the United States that I'll be performing on tour Hmm. um, outside of Branson. So we'll leave in January, and we'll come back to Branson in May, and for three months, uh, January, February, March, April, I'll be touring the United States and Canada. That's just because you like to work, because this is, it's, it goes dark in January, right, here basically throughout Branson, right? Yes. For the first quarter. Yes. Because it's, it's really big during December, and then at the first of January, it gets dark real fast. Poof, yeah. disappears. <laughs> and I actually drive the semi. You do? For my show. Okay. Yeah, about That's... a few years ago, one of our semis didn't make it to the show, and if somebody could have hopped in the front seat and driven, mm-hmm. it could have gotten there, and I thought, never again. So I went and got my my um, license, and now I'm the one driving the semi. Yeah, the commercial, commercial license. Yeah. So where are you going to be going on your tour then next year? Do you have an idea yet? Have they got oh, absolutely. Book? Are you going to be coming through Houston by chance? Um, I think you're going to have to go on my website Dallas, to see. I'll check it out. Okay. I know that we're going to Florida That's first. Yeah. RickThomas.com. <laughs> you go to Florida first, and then up to New York. We'll be going into Canada. We'll be doing um, Casino Rama if Canada opens up and everything's okay. Yeah, do you have problems though with customs and trying to get uh, props and illusions through? Oh, and everything? a little bit. It's not too tough because yeah. I think also trying to bring money back out or taking money in, there might be some issues of what you can sell. Well, or... that's where you need agents, um, and the agents receive the monies, and then okay, you get paid through. You just the... worry about your show. Yeah, Let I them just worry, worry about, about that the part. Show. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then uh, we go across to Colorado. Uh, back down into Vegas, uh, back across to Indiana, Ohio. Anyway, we're all over the place, yeah. and uh, and we're actually so thrilled that the the COVID is hopefully for the most part behind us, and we can get out there. Yeah. And people so much want to see live entertainment. I'm surprised you're actually going to go out on, on a tour because I would think that during a time when you're dark, you could actually repair 
tricks or your, some of your illusions and you could build some new ones to, you know rehearse you the kidding? new show I don't, I don't think i have much life left what are you talking about you, you say i can rest when you i die look young you look young oh my goodness i started my career i was i was a magician for the disneyland hotel when i was 17 for two years mm-hmm. uh and ever since then i never stopped i went i went pro at 13 i thought okay. i went real pro at 17 semi pro at 13. At 13 right yeah okay. first paycheck at 13 and uh and just never stopped and were you doing illusions then or are you just doing like 17 rabbits or i was doing the zigzag wow and okay. i was doing my birds and i hate birds and <laughs> you say that. Are you I serious? Say, yes. Okay. 40, 45 years of working with birds, and yes. It's just the audience likes it, so that's why you keep it in? Yeah, I keep it in. Really? I told you, everything in my show is the truth. Yeah, that's why I was questioning this. Everything okay. I say is the truth. I don't make up is stories. Is it dove dust you worry about for lungs and inhaling that, or just uh, <sighs> they freak you out, or what? No, it's just it's just the extra work. Well, that's true. I mean, you know... And if you don't, have you never worked with the animals before? Many of these magicians walk in, check on their rope and their rings and their their whatever they've got to check on, and then do their bit, and then they're home, and they never look back. With birds or animals, you got to take care of them. You got to <laughs> yeah. feed them. You, but tigers, same with uh, assistants. Did you know that you got <laughs> yeah, to feed them? You got to clothe them. You got to. Oh my word! <laughs> don't get assistants. Yeah, they're worse than birds. <laughs> But I would think that the wild animals would be higher maintenance than doves. I mean, I work with they doves are. and rabbits also. They but. are. They are. Mm-hmm. And that was a big deal. But now when the tigers are out of my show, you would think I'd want a break. And it doesn't, even if it's just the birds, just the little bit of cleaning the cages. Yes. And making sure they're fed. And it's just that extra hour. Do you have a guy that does that? or no, do you me. have that's, You're the guy. Well, my wife, Tara, <laughs> she, she'd tell you that she does it. Yeah. Uh, and she does. But yeah. um, she, like, again, she's... She's amazing in the show, and I'm so proud of what she brings to my show. And before I get it, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about an injury you may have sustained or a problem with uh, one of your animals. Did you, you were talking about if you haven't been bitten, mauled, or scratched or something by a wild animal, then you really haven't worked with them. Is there a story you can share about nope. that? Nope. Okay, you'd rather keep that out I'll of your keep mind. Keep that out of my mind. Yeah, even, don't bring those even forward. Even when Siegfried and Roy and I know there were times <laughs> where they were hurt and they would close their show and say they were on vacation. Yeah, and uh, I went to Zieg- Siegfried, and, you know, and they're past and gone now. But I was over the Magic Castle, and Siegfried had his arm in a sling, um, and I went up to Siegfried and I just like winked at him, and he's like, "Vacation?" He's like, "Vacation." <laughs> And I knew that forced vacation, uh, yeah, forced vacation. That you know he'd gotten kind of punched in the arm with. So it's just it is what it is, and yeah, and it's not that we try to keep it hidden. It's it it is a danger of that the, the industry, but you know we try to keep the fantasy as much as possible that these are exquisite animals, of and we're, we're lucky to be working with them, which we are. Which we are, yeah. We're still pretty stupid. Who actually is out there working? As we start to wrap up over here, who is still working with wild animals that you know today in the world? What illusionists? I don't know. I really, I really don't I can't know. think of any offhand who actually no. are out there. I'm sure I'll get some email from someone saying, someone's oh, so-and-so. Say, hey, someone's That's working That's right. With I'm them. working with them or whatever. Uh, like at theme parks or someplace else, I'm sure. It but, seems to be just – it's just going to go – it's like in the early 1900s, it was Grand Illusions. And then the 30s and 40s rolled around, and then it was parlor magic, and it was cards and billiard balls and cigarettes. And then all of a sudden, Doug Henning came back in, and Mark Wilson came back in, and Illusions were back again. And now we have Grand, we had grand Illusions. And I, even, you know, I had a conversation with Bill Smith, and he mm-hmm. was talking about the magic in Vegas mm-hmm. and kind of feeling like... Some of these shows where they get away with just doing card tricks in front of a big camera in a big theater is not the way that Grand Illusion should be presented. Right. And so we who still work with the Grand Illusions still feel that that's that's what should be presented. And I think there'll be a there'll be a flux again, and all sure. of a sudden maybe animals maybe animals will come back into it again some sometime yeah. in the future. Who knows? But when I see, for an example, they mentioned alluded to it, like Matt Franco, who's doing a big show in Vegas uh, there, and you are doing a big show here. Those are two completely separate types of shows, uh, certainly, and both bringing in big audiences and everything. So. People enjoy both, I believe. And, but, again, as I said at the first part of this, you tend to have the, the old Las Vegas show that you have brought back. That's, uh, that's, that's great. 
I enjoy it. Don't say the word old. Hey, I can say it's it because I am. Wrong. It's just I wrong. Am. It's just wrong. <laughs> I have people come up to me and the vintage. Uh, How about that vintage? I, Val I, Vegas. Th- I had a woman even this last <laughs> week. She was probably she. I know how old she was. She's just thirty-seven years old, mm-hmm. and she came and she goes. I saw you in Las Vegas when I was a little girl. Like, oh my word, get out of here now. Don't even, don't even, you know, because I literally on, and you guys saying the show, I I am really still moving around on stage. Oh, you're doing a lot. Yes, you are. You're moving quickly. Yeah, I'm moving uh, back quickly. Back and forth. That's why you're not a big guy, you know, and I'm sure you work out as well, but you have a lot of workouts you're doing on the show. Well, the last time I saw your show, I'd taken my son, Sean, it was for his 21st birthday out to Vegas, and we came to the Tropicana to see your show. Uh, I remember they had like a big wheel out front. You could spin and got two for got one. Got free tickets. That's right. Yeah. So we came in to see your show. And, uh, and, and so it's been a while. And that was, uh, let me think about that. <clears throat> Here we uh, go. About 23 years ago. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And that was uh, a great show. I remember then. And <laughs> even better now. Uh, <laughs> that's again, right. Just, even better That's now. right. You have aged like fine wine, my friend. <laughs> You have. I know what I'm doing. Yes. I really know what I'm doing. I, I'm very comfortable with the audience. You seem to be. It is not about, I, it is about the magic. But what it is, is you master your art sure. and then put it to the side and just entertain. Mm-hmm. If you think it's about the magic and you think it's about fooling people and that's what it's all about, you're missing you're missing your mark. Uh, it is about really entertaining the audience. Magic's my vehicle. But but I can tell you now, like you're saying, I really I break that fourth wall. I mm-hmm. break it. I I communicate with the audience. They know that we're all family. Mm-hmm. They can feel it. They feel like this is the first time I've ever performed. Yet I've done it so many times, and yeah. it's just that comfort zone that I have sure. in presenting the show. Which, as we wrap up, the last question I always ask my guests, uh, since it is called the Magic Word Podcast, of what is your magic word? What is your philosophy of life? Dream. It's, not, it's a, oh dream. Well, straight away, you know, straight away. Yeah, yeah never my, stop dreaming. My basically. entire life has been about, about following your dreams. Yeah, and uh, the my my slogan is nothing happens until you dream. And nothing happens until you dream. I love that. Yeah, that's nothing the way to live life. Until you dream. Yeah. Now you've got to act upon those dreams, but uh, it is just it just fits. And I know I I followed my dreams and I've made them a reality. And I know I I preach it in my show, and I don't really help people follow their dreams, but I hope that I inspire. And uh, that is my wish for people to follow their dreams and to make it a reality, and do the best they can at, at getting through life. Uh, we all have our challenges, but. Yes. Uh, but man, it's a it's an awesome ride. It's been a great journey. I've enjoyed seeing you throughout uh, my, our careers. Uh, <laughs> you know, yes. you uh, doing what you're doing is fantastic. Congratulations on this show, and again, I recommend anybody should come out of the way to go to Branson to come out here to uh, the Mickey Gilly Shanghai Theater to come and see your show. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> you got I appreciate it. it. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Rick Thomas. This is Scotty Out. Positively delightful. Thank you so very much. I appreciate the time you have given us here, Rick. It was a lot of fun just to catch up after all these years and also to share a lot about your career and things I didn't know and also to hear about the big cats and everything else. And I wish you nothing but the best of luck and good fortune for the future because uh, not only do you deserve it, I know that you're going to reach it because you have a dream, you have a goal, and you'll reach it. And that's what I'm always telling all of the people here who live Listen, if you will, just uh, the best way is to achieve a, a goal is to set one, first of all, and then work towards that. Anyhow, that's a whole other subject. <laughs> but I want to thank you again, Rick, for being my guest and for your time and words and your friendship. So I know next week we're going to be heading to the Texas Association of Magician of Convention, and we'll be reporting some daily updates from there. So be sure to check back here on a regular basis because we'll have those daily updates coming fairly fast and furious each each day. And we'll have a lot of conversations with the registrants and the dealers and organizers and the talent. And who knows? Just a, a lot of fun. And I I know if you don't attend this convention, this is the next best thing to being there. And if you are attending that convention, it's perhaps a good thing to listen to because you might hear some things here. There were some conversations you may have missed with some people who you wanted to talk to. 
And in that regard, let me point out again, we will not be having a regular podcast next Thursday released because the convention actually begins on Friday the 3rd and runs through the 6th. So we'll be doing those daily updates, probably posting those Friday night, perhaps early Saturday morning. But I may have a prelude that will be posted late Thursday night or very early Friday morning. They will tell you about some of the activities that are happening on Thursday because we're having a special unveiling of the Houdini street sign. (laughs) This should be pretty cool. This will be the first street named after Houdini in the state of Texas. And we're going to have a special unveiling on Thursday. So I will be posting that along with some other information that will be happening on Thursday because we're going to be then going over to see Ray Anderson at Esther's Follies and then going back to the hotel where we're going to be having a a little meet and greet, I believe, with some of the collectors and talking about the unveiling and Houdini and some other things. So I'll probably be talking with a few people and I might be posting again a prelude late Thursday night, perhaps early Friday morning. So uh, again, don't expect another podcast uh, the next Thursday in our regular scheduled time after I've already said we're going to be returning to that. Actually, we will not be returning to that next week because of the convention that's going to intervene. And we'll be having, again, uh, a lot of content that we posted. Uh, uh, again, last week we had two days of uh, content from the convention in Las Vegas. But next week in Austin, we're going to be having four different days. So anyhow, come back and join us again next week and be sure and join us on the pod letter. I also suggest if you are listening or watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We certainly do appreciate that. And also, if you could leave us a five-star rating, if you really like this podcast, then please go to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and uh, give us a five-star rating with some nice comments. That really helps us advance this and move on up in the rankings. All that really does help. So be sure to subscribe uh, to the podcast as well. Anyhow, you know what to do. Thanks again. We appreciate your patronage and for listening and coming back week after week. And so until next week, stay well, get booked. And remember to dream because nothing happens until you dream. This is Scotty out. 